Good morning and welcome to Reveal's 2020 webinar series and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Kelly and I'm going to be your host today for today's webinar. This year's webinar series provides insights on how to best leverage your SAP asset as it relates to your business and how each functional area will be affected by S4HANA. Today, we set the stage for turning SAP into an asset by improving procurement spend as a whole. As we get started with today's discussion, the webinar is going to last approximately 30 to 45 minutes, followed by a question and answer session. And then if you could please um, capture your questions in the question or chat section um, in the webinar panel there. And um, later today, our webinar will be available on our website under resources. And at, that t at this time, I would like to introduce you to our speaker today, David Morin. Dave is an integration advisor at Reveal, and he's got over 35 years of experience working in supply chain within a variety of positions, beginning his career in materials management and operations, and then extending into supply chain technology implementation and improvement. Dave provides practical and workable solutions that leverage processes and business improvements. So with that said, I'd like to turn your presentation over to Dave and get started today. Okay, thank you very much, Kelly. So as uh, we talked about, we're gonna learn how to really turn SAP into an asset where we're, we're seeing some return on it. Um, what I wanna do today in this session is we will go over the key metrics for procurement managers We'll talk about automating procurement. We'll talk about measuring our performance, and then we'll wrap it up. So before we do that, when we implement SAP, one of the things that we need to do, which is so very, very critical, is to make sure that all of the work that we're doing in our system and our enterprise and all the activity that people do and work very hard is all done within the system itself. What you're seeing here is what we call the value funnel. The value funnel identifies at the top the business behaviors. That's the kind of work that we do as individuals that are typically outside of our system. We work outside of SAP. We may have some Excel reports. We may do some manual manipulation of reports. We may even have some third party software that we have interfaced with our system. These are all activities that take place outside of the SAP system. What we want to do at the bottom of the screen, you can see business rules. Those are the rules that are within SAP that guide SAP on how to conduct business. It identifies, for example, the recipes or bill of materials. It looks at available to promise calculation, lead times, lot sizing, and other master data parameters that help the SAP engine run. If you look at this value funnel, on the far left, we talk about information ownership. It is so imperative when implementing SAP and making sure that SAP is running the way we intend, that we identify materials or segments or groups of materials to a certain person responsible for their management. By doing that, you have one person who's responsible for the SAP implementation and or uh, SAP transformation in everyday life of that material within its supply chain. Information ownership is very, very important. And you'll see as we talk through the uh, presentation, we'll talk about MRP controller as an example of that. Then grouping and prioritizing our materials. In order for us to be efficient, efficient in our planning process, we wanna make sure that materials that are like materials are planned together. We would not want to try and uh, schedule or optimize materials that are obsolete or expired with other materials that are very high volume saleable products. So the key of grouping and prioritizing is very important so that we can segment those materials 
and we can control their behavior the way we would like to. And the court report, of course, report frequency. How do we report out of the system to let us know what is going on and keep our finger on the pulse? So today, when you walk into an SAP system that's been running for many, many, many years, you may find that you are at the very beginning at the very top of this uh, value funnel. And we call that the delta. And as you go through the process of identifying your business behaviors and identifying your business rules and the information ownership and grouping and prioritizing, you start to take a look at a, a process called exception monitoring. So SAP is constantly trying to balance supply and demand. And when it does, it's in good sense and fully balanced, it, it's good and it works. It doesn't identify that you have any um, issues. If you have an imbalance of supply and demand, or SAP can't plan, or there's something that's causing um, a true balance, SAP identifies that with an exception message. And uh, this key process of exception monitoring is critical when you start working with an SAP system to be able to interact with it and let the system do the heavy lifting and you manage the exceptions of the process because the system is so large and there's so many materials to try and do it manually, it would be impossible. So you start with this process of exception monitoring, working with the system to identify where the exceptions are in it. As you start to work with this process, you start to look at process performance. How is it getting better? How are you tweaking your materials? How are you what's called optimizing your materials? We'll talk about that in a little bit. But as you're refining your business rules and as you're changing your business behaviors, you start to move through this funnel and the funnel starts to close and you become much more efficient. And so now that you've worked on exception monitoring and you're monitoring your process, SAP has many. Uh, analytical tools standard in the system that help you analyze your process. And now you're able to work less outside the system because your business behavior has changed and you've been able to move that inside. You've been able to correct and maintain your master data or your business rules. So now that the SAP system thinks the way you want to think, and now you can use the analytical tools within SAP to see where the variances are and how you can improve it. What does that all equal? It equals business value. And as a result of that business value, your stock levels will be correct. You won't have stock in the wrong places. Your materials will be optimized. And think of optimization of materials as a race car engine. When it's running perfectly, it's completely tuned. That's optimization. Your service to your customers, internal and external customers will go up. You become much more flexible with any types of situation that may come your way, be it a line down or a larger customer order, which you need to make uh, arrangements for. Your costs will reduce, your revenue will increase, and at the same time, the information in the system will be accurate, you will trust it, and people will rely on the system and instead of sometimes finding yourself in a deathward spiral when nothing's going right, you're going to be reversing that because you'll have worked your way through the value funnel. And SAP will now become a very valuable tool for you that you'll never be able to realize you live without. So once you get that capability in your SAP system, now you really can take a look at how do I go and measure my performance of procurement? Okay, I know I have SAP. I know it's running properly. I know my master data is set up and my users are working inside the system. If you don't have those criteria from the value funnel, it will be very difficult for you to maintain the metrics for procurement. You'll do a lot of calculations. You'll do a lot of report downloading in Excel. It'll be very inefficient and you'll be continually working outside the system. But if you're working inside the system, 
you can go through these metrics and the system will allow you to be able to do quick measurements of them to see how you're doing. The first of which is procurement lead times. And that is from the time you place the order through the goods received, how long does that take? Are your system lead times accurate? Do they reflect reality? Do they reflect the current crisis in the world if there are any, such as a trucking strike or road construction or major delays? When we create a procurement document, such as a purchase order, we create a statistical delivery date automatically. And until that purchase order is issued, the delivery date and the statistical date will be the same. And when it's issued to the supplier and released, it will then be independent. Are we measuring our suppliers to the statistical date or are we measuring to the delivery date that the suppliers say they can do? Now that's very critical because if the lead times in the system are correct and you have good collaboration with your suppliers, you should be able to create a purchase order where your delivery due date and your statistical due date will be the same and performance of such will happen. If they're not, are we measuring against that? Our planned delivery time, are we measuring our on-time deliveries? Are we measuring quantity against the order quantity? Are we measuring quality? Are we looking at the standard reports within SAP to help us measure that key metric? In addition to lead times, are we looking at the quality of the delivery as well as the adherence to different criteria? If we bring things in early, do we have more inventory carrying costs? If we bring things in late, are we affecting a line or inventory carrying costs going up or missed opportunity? Are we using vendor evaluation to manage and, and monitor our vendors and to give a scorecard to ourselves so that we can see how they're performing against our expected behavior? We'll talk a little bit about vendor evaluation um, further. The procurement lead times and the quality assurance metrics are two key performance metrics that a procurement manager needs to look at on a regular basis. Before I get going on the next slide, are there any questions or, or something jumping out that people have? Okay. So when we go and put SAP in, SAP is a very large investment and it's an asset. And all too often, there's a lot of work and justification of the asset through the procurement process. And then they go through, we do an implementation of SAP, for example, and then people walk away and it's life as is. Do we ever go back and return the return on investment? Do we ever measure that return on investment as compared to what was expected in the uh, proposal? Are the business behaviors and the business rules aligned? Like we mentioned in the value funnel. So are we looking at this asset that we've spent millions of dollars on post implementation and did we get our value out of that implementation is the asset doing what we expect it to do and more so have we stopped working and leveraging that asset once we were able to post the transaction all too important implementations teach people how to do transactions and then they go live and then the, the effort stops. How do you leverage that asset to be able to make it a key performance indicator machine to be able to run your business, to do the heavy lifting and the calculations and be able to think the way you think and run the business as efficient as possible are we still doing that as a company? Many companies are not. So ROI is something that is very important and ongoing assessment of what we're doing with the 
with the SAP system is critical. Spend management. One part of SAP that everybody puts together in an ROI is they look at how much they're spending. They want to have better control over the purchases. Well, one of the things that SAP allows you to do is there is the capability of buying against material numbers, such as inventory, and there's the capability of buying against other objects such as internal orders or general ledger account numbers. So one of the things that we should be doing is, how are we measuring the spend? Are we looking at direct material spend versus non-material spend? Are we buying things without material numbers? Are we buying against cost centers? Are we losing visibility and maybe negotiating volume and identifying large uh, business expenses by buying against the GL? And do we have unmanaged expenses? So spend management is a critical key on looking at the key performance indicators. And we'll talk a little bit about in this presentation, some of the report capabilities of SAP that allow you to look at that. So we mentioned exception monitoring when sap doesn't have the supply and and demand in balance right and exception monitoring will identify opportunities to reduce our cost or avoid cost altogether so are the exception messages for cancel and reschedule items being acted upon and are they part of the daily routine so when we implement SAP and we're in the value funnel and we're doing all of our work inside the value funnel and we're doing exception monitoring and SAP comes back and says, hey, I have an exception message here. You have a purchase order that's coming in in three weeks that you do not need. Cancel that purchase order. Are we acting upon that? If we don't act upon it, we could be buying material that's going to sit in stock. It's probably going to become dead stock, which is perfectly good stock, but just not usable. It's not being used. Or eventually it could be obsolete stock where product life curve is over and that material is still hanging around. That represents real dollars. It represents real space in the warehouse. It represents real time for the people to check it in and count it and put it away. So SAP will give you these exception messages to reschedule items, either pull it in, saying you don't have enough, you're going to run short, bring it in, or else you don't need this right now. Push it out for two to three weeks or two days, or whatever the case may be, and offset those costs for a bit. Cost avoidance is a huge part of SAP. And all too often, people don't look at it because it's in the inventory and people don't really see the management of inventory as that cost. We have a mantra here at Resol at that uh, reveal and it's fix it now and fix it today. Okay. If you see that of cancel this order, SAP is telling you to cancel the order because of this is a cost avoidance. You don't need it. And our mantra is to do it before the end of the business day to follow up with that right fix it right when you're working on it if you can't do it right then fix it today and then if you still can't do it we have an application called action tracker and to follow up on and manage that so that's critical for cost avoidance and requirements of being a key performance metric the other key performance metric is our supplier base are we managing our supplier base do we have tens of thousands of suppliers we're buying one or two things from or are we looking at pareto analysis in managing our suppliers do we have 80 percent of our procurement with only 20 percent of our suppliers where we can build relationships and collaborate with these suppliers collaboration with suppliers and strategic positioning is it happening when you look at the supply chain and the steps of the supply chain of source, procure, make, deliver, 
just because Source Procure may be an outside supplier, you want to treat them as if they're under your own roof. You want to build relationships with them. You want to collaborate with them. You want to be able to pick up the phone and talk to them on a regular basis. Understand what their issues are with their manufacturing, for example, and they understand what your issues are with your manufacturing. And the collaboration is critical, particularly at managing that supplier base. Other ones are contract compliance. Are we leveraging the capabilities of SAP and all of the document types within SAP to give us the expected output that we have and that we need? Are we leveraging contracts? We've just talked about supplier performance and the, comp the, the collaboration with that. Are we using contracts? so that they can see what the requirement is in terms of a quantity contract. I'm going to buy this many of this material over the next year, or I'll spend this much money with you over the next year. Are we creating a relationship that they are an extension of our supply chain and they're treated as such? I can't tell you over the years how I've had relationships with suppliers where I've not met my contractual obligations because of our business conditions being down and telling them you have the right to bill me for the unused portion and then coming back and saying, I'm not billing you. Our relationship is too strong. That collaboration is so critical, particularly with contracts. It, it, it's an extension of your supply chain and you should treat it as such. How are we doing with our delivery dates? Okay. Are we communicating delivery dates to our suppliers? Are they accurate? Do we have the right lead times in the system? If the supplier calls you and con continually changes the delivery date and we're measuring against what he says the delivery date is, is that accurate? How does that compare against our statistical delivery date? Is he hitting the statistical delivery date? If we have good relationships with our suppliers and our master data is accurate and we have good collaboration with them, we should be able to manage to our statistical delivery date. They should be able to provide shipment and supply product to our statistical delivery date. There shouldn't be any surprises. Those are critical in the key performance targets and measurements. And then if they're not, we should be looking at top total cost of ownership. Are they delivering product that is meeting our quality specifications? If not, what's the cost of that quality in terms of rework or impacted efficiency reductions in our production lines? Are they causing our manufacturing to be delayed and lines go down because we're waiting for the delivery? Are we missing customer orders because our supplier is negligent in delivery to us? Are we impacting our customer, right? And if they ship us very, very early, are we looking at the total cost of that carrying cost as a component added to their purchase price to take a look at total cost? If they're shipping something three months in advance or two months in advance or a month in advance, it costs money to hold that, right? Is that being added to their unit price to calculate a total cost? So delivery is critical, and it's critical to the statistical delivery date, not what the supplier keeps changing. What was your original date? I want to go now into automating procurement. So we're picture yourself in the value funnel. We're doing exception monitoring every day and things are looking really, really good. We have a great um, supply and demand level. Our exceptions are low. Our process is really being adhered to. How can we automate and leverage SAP to create some efficiencies? So before we do that, we really need to understand what our inventory looks like, what's the behavior look like, 
that we're in, in, uh, forcing on our inventory. So we have to understand our stock principles. So if you look at this graph, the red line represents inventory. And you can see there's a dotted line which represents the average inventory over that period. But the inventory is up and down. There's no rhyme or reason to it. And the deviation, which is I call the width of the road, it's very high. So we're using this whole road and it's all over the place. It doesn't really look like it's got any kind of repeatable pattern to it at all. Picture it as a person coming into a doctor's office and he's about to suffer a heart attack and that's his heartbeat. So what do we want to do? We at Reveal actually talk about the heartbeat. The blue line represents what we want to do to reduce the fluctuations in that activity. So if you can have demand coming in at a repeatable pace, right? And that inventory reductions, which are represented by the down line, okay? Again, the blue, blue line is your inventory. And you can see inventory is gradually being uh, reduced or consumed on a regular basis. And then you have a replenishment of inventory, which is the line that goes up. And then it's being consumed again. What now what we see is your consumption or the inventory reduction is very consistent and they're parallel. Your receipt quantities are the same and they're um, very, very good timing in terms of the gaps. So now we have a process where we have reduced the fluctuations. And if you look at the red line versus the blue line, we are very much starting to look like we're in control. And the patient, what we call the heartbeat, is now under control. The receipts coming in are accurate and consistent, and the demand and the issues out are accurate. Now that we have that control, we have that patient's heartbeat, we look at them and say, okay, we're gonna do some exercise. We're gonna lose some weight, for example. You see here the word dead stock in each one of these columns. Dead stock is stock which is absolutely conforming to product specification. Picture it as inventory in a barrel. And you're taking material out of the top of the barrel. While the red line graph fluctuations are all over, there may be time you dip into the bottom of the barrel and then there's times that you don't. When you start to reduce your fluctuations, you're not using that much of the bottom of the barrel, right? So the dead stock is, is going up. Now again, dead stock is perfectly good material. It is conforming to product specifications. You just get that buffer that you're just not using. So now what we do is how do we reduce the average stock? We've already proved that we can create some stability with the blue line. How do we just move that blue line activity down and have less stock in the barrel? And then continue the replenishment as such and reduce that dead stock. That dead stock represents space, it rep represents value, and it represents cost because you have to count it. If it's a product that expires, you have to watch the expiration date on it. So the more we can reduce our dead stock, the more we'll, inven we'll have inventory turns go up and the lower our cost will be. So this is the principle that we want to go and really drive as we move forward. And at the same time, we always want to avoid a stock out. So we want to reduce that stock, but yet we don't want to short anybody. Again, we reduce our fluctuations. We have aligned the supplier delivery frequencies, okay? You can see that in the blue graph. We reduced dead stocks. We had no stock outs. Now, oh my God, it's a perfect opportunity to be able to put that on automation 
and then manage it by exception. So when we get to the green line graph, we're now ready to start letting SAP manage it automatically, and we don't have to manage it on a, on a weekly or daily basis because we've let the system create the uh, replenishment and the based on the demand and MRP, and we trust it. Now we can manage it by exceptions and only exceptions. And you'll be able to see that opportunity of what it looks like. And again, by doing that, we, we try to strive to get to that yellow line, we'll reduce our inventory carrying costs, we'll reduce our space in our warehouse, we'll be able to make our warehouses last longer in regards to space, we don't have to open as many warehouses because we're managing our inventory that much better. And for product that's expiry with expiration dates, we don't want to lose product that is beyond expiration and have to scrap it out. So that being said, when we collaborate with our supplier and before we kick off automation, we want to make sure we set ourselves up for success. And you can see in this graph here, the white line of inclusion shows inconsistent frequency from your vertical red lines, which are your goods receipts. So your goods receipts are very infrequent and you can see the quantities are very infrequent which lead me to believe that the master data is not accurate, which is the bottom side of that funnel and lot sizing techniques. So you wanna let these graphs, which are standard in the SAP system, these are just standard graphs coming out of SAP, leveraging these graphs to tell the story. And the story will indicate how you become much more efficient and leverage SAP because it's telling you, for example, here, you're, you're inconsistent in the frequency of your buy, your quantities are not consistent, and you, in order to become very reliable and be able to use automation, you need to have that under control. Now that we, have to, we understand all of that, what are there some capabilities to using SAP procurement document types to help us? One of them is a scheduling agreement. The scheduling agreement is a long-term purchase agreement with a vendor covering, covering product uh, based on predetermined conditions. It can be created with access and links to other documents, right? And it can be um, used and, and, and leveraged to take advantage of negotiated pricing. And there are some other capabilities with scheduling agreements such as um time fences that allow you to be able to work with the supplier to be able to identify firm and trade-off zones so that you can put a larger schedule out there where the supplier has a surety that you're going to take your product and you can collaborate with him on procuring long lead time materials without fear of you canceling an order and work together to be able to develop those um those zones you can shorten processing times. It's gonna reduce the paperwork because the scheduling agreement will actually take the place of a purchase order. So if you work with a supplier going into the beginning of the year and you can say to them, this is what I'm gonna buy, the plan for the next 12 months, I'm gonna give you monthly deliveries. The first two months will be released, no problem. The next three months will be, um, it's a trade-off, what they call a trade-off zone. I'll cover the cost of your raw materials if you buy it, right? I may change the dates a little bit, but I'm, I'm committed to those volumes. But after six months to 12 months, it's gonna be like water, it's very flexible. So if you look at it as ice and slush and water, it gives you the capability of working with the supplier and collaborating with him, giving him a surety that you're gonna buy the products, and he's got some assurity he can buy long lead time items. They can be automated schedule lines with MRP, and you can control the changes of the quantity. And the key is you're allowing the vendor the ability to plan and plan efficiently, which is going to then allow you to get product when you need it in the quantities that you need. 
The other big feature with SAP is auto PO functionality. If you have a supplier who you're buying from on a regular basis, and their quality is top notch, and you have a great forecast, and you're spending time with that every week putting purchase orders out there, you can allow the system to be set up and leverage the system to create the purchase orders automatically and eliminate the manual handle. You don't have to touch it as often. The fewer times you touch the purchase order, the better off you're going to be. You'll have time to spend it on uh, proactive type activities instead of repeatable uh, purchase order activities that can be done by the system. You'll look to manage the exceptions only. You won't be handling purchase orders while you're expanding while you should be working on the exceptions of material uh, supply and demand not being in balance, today you're putting purchase orders together every week for the same product. If you let the system do that, you can address the issues that need to be addressed today. And if your materials are optimized, at the bottom part of that funnel, with all of the master data settings that are accurate, and you know they're accurate, and you're working inside the system, you can allow the system to create the purchase orders for you and you can only manage the exceptions. It's a very powerful tool, particularly for suppliers that are very good and for product that's within the middle of your life cycle where you're not gonna run out because it's the end of the life cycle or it's not a new product introduction. Again, if we're in the value funnel, and we've optimized our material and we're working in the system, SAP has many capabilities of procurement documents to be able to use. There are several types of purchase orders from subcontracting to consignment, stock transfer orders, so you can buy from a sister company inside your company code or outside your company code, or service purchase orders. We talked about scheduling agreements with release documentation. We, we talked about firm and trade-off zones. How do you get the supplier to not worry about this long purchase order and volume you're putting out? You can give him a uh, firm zone. I'm definitely buying these products in the next two months at this schedule. And the trade-off zone, the three months after that, I'm going to buy the raw materials if I cancel. You have a surety to be able to move forward. And then the balance, right, you'll work out. You collaborate with your suppliers. I can't say how important vendor conversation and collaboration is. And then quant contracts. How do you measure your procurement documents? You can set them up against quantity and, and value, and you can tie those two to your procurement documents. So these are all key performance me uh, metrics and automation of procurement. And the beautiful thing with SAP is measuring their performance. SAP is so robust with information systems throughout it that it allows you to be able to create vendor reports. You can look at purchasing spend by supplier. You can look at on-time delivery for quality and for quantity. You can tie specific materials and group them to material groups and you can run reports on those groups. You can look at the reliability of the deliveries, the frequency, and you can look at spend by material group. And what's nice about those material groups is you can segment them accordingly. You could have material groups for new products, for you know, platform A, platform B, platform C, and it gives you that ability to slice and dice data standard in the system. You have the ability to look at general analysis from different purchasing documents. You can say, give me, give me an analysis based on purchase orders or scheduling agreements. Give me scheduling agreements with this material group or this um, purchase order with material group. List display. I can go and list all kinds of reports based on inventory and you can segment and um, segregate based on material group or, or purchase orders or number ranges, material types, 
you could separate material type by raw material or work in process material or finished goods um, or trading goods, those goods that you buy and then you just sell. I wanna see reports on that. I wanna see reports on that based on these dates, right? And then lead time. How are my lead times? I have, you know, you can run reports in SAP by lead time and you can compare what's in my info record versus my material master versus my vendor master. And I can compare that with what does SAP calculate? So if my info record says I have a 10 day lead time, which is um, what it's going to go and look at first. And then if the vendor master says I have a 30 day lead time, right? If it doesn't have an info record, it's going to look at the vendor master. And if it doesn't have a lead time in the vendor master, it's going to look at the material master, right? And if the material master is 10 days, the system will actually tell you that the actual based on calculation of actual documents is three days. So you'll be able to do some very quick analysis. What's my master data settings as compared to what my actual is? And how do I take action to make sure my master data, which is the bottom size of that funnel, right? Accurate so that my exception monitoring will be fewer exceptions. I can do more work in the system and then I can collaborate with my suppliers and me measure my performance. Vendor evaluation, very quickly. If you've gotten to the point where your master data is very good and you're collaborating with your vendors very well, and you wanna start measuring all your suppliers against a standard that's consistent across the board, SAP in standard functionality offers a product called vendor valuation okay and it's it'll measure your vendors based on uniform criteria and you can compute the scores manually or automatically and as you mature in your use of sap and as you mature in your collaboration with your suppliers this is a very valuable tool to be able to sit with your suppliers and look at the results at the end of each year, for example, before you go into the previous year for budget purposes. You can look at it in, in terms of materials or services. You can look at it in time delivery, quality, service, pricing, and you can calculate scores based on that. I can't think of a better way of sitting there with your suppliers if you have your suppliers in a Pareto analysis where 80% of your suppliers, excuse me, 20% of your suppliers is making up 80% of your volume, and you can meet with those suppliers every single year in the fall, talk about the following year, and talk about the year that you're coming out of with real data, and how you can both perform better going into the following year. It's such a valuable tool that, you know when you're at this point, you've leveraged SAP to its fullest, looking at those key performance indicators to be able to make yourself world-class. That's what I have for you today, folks. Um, there's a, there was a lot of information here between the key performance indicators, the value funnel, how to understand the, the movement of materials and inventory and how to control a heartbeat and to be able to move to automation. And then how do I manage and, and measure my suppliers and collaborate them with them on a regular basis? That is the, the, the end of my presentation. Are there any questions out there at all that I could answer for you? Yeah, we actually do have some questions for you, Dave. Oh, great. Um, the first one we have is, uh, is in scheduling agreement, can we do green before delivery date? I, I'm assuming it's green. It's, she has G-R-N, um, before delivery date, meaning is it accepting early delivery? If not, why? Yes, you can. And you can do the, it, it, I think she's talking about the goods receipt date, the GR. Um, you can do that goods receipt, and then you can measure the performance against that. And you can tie delivery tolerances to that as well. 
Okay, thanks, Dave. And then we also have, do exceptions really mean anything and are they really that important? Oh, wow, that was a great question. Um, you know, when I started out doing SAP many years ago, I saw this when we went live and nobody explained to me what the value was in this exception monitoring. And over the years, having worked with it and understanding it, it's one of the most valuable tools that SAP provides you. Because remember what MRP does. MRP has been around for 50 to 60 years and it balances, uh, excuse me, balances supply with demand. And the exception monitors, when you're running a SAP system with hundreds of thousands of materials, you can't look at every one of them. The exception monitoring will communicate to you when you are out of balance. And so it's an invaluable tool. It will give you the heads up that says, I don't have enough stock, pull the order in, or you have too much stock, cancel this order. So it is extremely important. And you know that you've been successful with an SAP uh, transformation or implementation when you're in the value funnel, you're not doing any work outside the value funnel, and you are following exception monitoring, and the only exceptions that you have are the ones that were created in the last MRP run. Then you know you've been very successful in using that tool in balancing supply and demand and making customers, both internal and external, satisfied. It looks like um, we do have one other question here. Uh, you mentioned optimization. What is meant by that? So, you know, um, I, I try to put things in um, a perspective where people can understand it. So think of your uh, SAP system as an Indy car. When that car goes out on that track, it is tweaked for the performance to be the best that it can be. It's not going to backfire. It's not going to sputter. The timing is going to be perfect. It's got the perfect oil in it. It's got the perfect gas in it. And your SAP system should be the same way. Your materials within SAP have many, many views on the material master. Each one of those views have many fields in them. And those fields, think of those as the little tweaks in that IndyCar. Those fields and the data represented in those fields are what makes that SAP motor run well. And if the fields and the entries in those fields are not accurate, you're not going to get a SAP engine uh, running to the, the peak performance. If lead times aren't accurate, or your bill of materials aren't accurate, or your costs aren't accurate, right, or your replenishment strategy is not accurate, you're going to get an engine that doesn't run well, and hence, you're not gonna procure product or make product when a need uh, comes around for your customers. And so by optimizing, it's the review of the material masters and all of the associated fields in those material masters to make sure that they are correctly set and to make sure that they, they're fine-tuned ongoing to make sure that the SAP system engine runs well as best as it can be. Okay, thanks, David. I think that is all the questions that we have for today. And um, if anybody has any further questions or wants to have any other conversations, please feel free to reach out to us um, with the information here shown on this um, slide. We'll be happy to answer any further questions you have. Um, and thank you everybody again for joining us today. This webinar is gonna be available on our website at revealvalue.com under the resources tab. Um, and you'll also find all of our other previously recorded webinars, as well as other information and content areas, our white papers, success stories, and other helpful tips and tools that we offer. Um, our next webinar is next month, which is June 15th, and it's turning SAP into an asset by aligning production planning master data objects. And this is going to be presented by Sammy Nigam. 
and we'll go ahead and send that information out to you well in advance. Uh, we hope you can attend and have a great day. And thanks, everyone, again for joining us today.